Good morning. How's everyone doing? Wow, that is the interaction I was told I'd get. Zero. All right. So let's see if this thing all works. Yes, it does. So this is a little bit about me. Um, let's just say that I've been around a little bit. Uh, I've worked for big, small companies. I've worked for government agencies, contracting, consulting, lots of different things. Um, and the only reason I'm actually going into this, usually I skip it because it doesn't matter, is to show you that I, I have had experience with a lot of different types of organizations. So where I'm coming from is, is, a, is a seat of experience on not just one company or two companies, but like a bunch of different companies. I've also helped with different organizations. But the only thing that should matter is that I have a certificate that says I know I have a BS in cybersecurity. So all of this is BS. Come on, that was funny. All right, this is how we're going to start. And I have prizes. So if I do get an interaction, there's prizes. So. Please raise your hand if you know what that thing is up there on the screen, KRB TGT. Keep it raised, raise right high. All right, keep it raised, like, there we go. All right, if you have an idea of what that is, keep it raised if you think you can change the password for that thing every six months. Keep it raised if you think you can change it every week. Not a single hand. Oh, there we go, we got two hands. How about every day? And there's the hands. So, it's a trick question. The KRB TGT is the thing that signs all of the Kerberos tickets in Windows. It's the thing that controls how Kerberos talks in Windows. That KRB TGT password can change as fast as your domain controllers can sync it, which can be five minutes, two hours, a day, two days, whatever it is, however long it takes. And this is the problem. This is what I'm going to be talking about in this keynote, is that the information about real security, about real changes, doesn't disseminate very well. And I'll talk about why. So we're going to get real uncomfortable because some of these some of these little mantras that we're going to talk about are things that all of you, including myself, talk about at conferences and complain about at conferences. Every single one of these that I'm going to be talking about, I've heard already at this conference. I was at training, so that's cheating a little bit, but I've already heard all of these complaints. So this is what we call the InfoSec echo chamber. I'm literally in a chamber speaking and echoing. It's great. So we're going to be talking about each one of these. First one, users are dumb, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Passwords will never get better. NFA is the way to go. Just use pro uh, uh, password managers. No one ever listens to us. Open Wi-Fi is bad. Antivirus is useless, right? Roll your own crypto is a bad idea. That one should get at least a couple nods, right? Blinky boxes are bad. It's legacy, you can't touch it. Just sanitize input, just turn off NTLM, just, just, just everything else. You can't measure security, why, why would you try? And IT sucks at asset management. These are all things we agree on, yes? Yeah, every one of those is exactly right. And that's the problem. So, users are dumb. 
computer users, employees, and non-security people don't tend to follow best practices. Yes? OK, I'm going to sit right here until I get some kind of interaction. There we go. One of the biggest targets in an organization is definitely the users, right? All right. Phishing is also the number one cause of breaches in the last year. That's the problem. So what are we doing about it? Nothing. <laughs> I'm not going to repeat that. We're, we're, we're training the users, right? We're teaching them our job. So users will continue to click on random and sketchy software with macros in them. Yes, it's going to happen no matter how much we teach them our job. User awareness training can help decrease these numbers, but we're talking about vitamin C. Anyone know about vitamin C? What does vitamin C do? What does your mom tell you about vitamin C? It helps prevent colds, right? So we'll talk about that in a second. User awareness training is just another corporate training that everyone, including you, clicks as hard as you can. Next, 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 next. Where's my certificate? Right? Incentivizing security is by far the better answer. How many of you in this room have heard about um, security awareness through incentives? Very, yeah, a couple, OK. We got a couple. Do you know what the, this means that security awareness can be set up in a way that is not a next, 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 next finish. It's a, hey, I reported something and I get points. How much do you think it costs a corporation to give out points? Zero. Zero. So if I give everyone points for, uh, for turning in a fish that turns out to be malicious or, or stopping with someone who is trying to tailgate. How do you think the users feel about that, those points? Greater than zero, right? Because they can use those points for something. Or they just get to be the number one on the list. Com competition is, amazing, is an amazing uh, instigator of change. So why aren't we using these programs instead of the next, 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 give me my cert? Why isn't that more out there? Why, isn't, why aren't more people doing that? It's because we are speaking in an echo chamber. So vitamin C, just as an aside, doesn't really do anything. <laughs> um, it's been proven that all it does is help to shorten the amount of time you have your cold versus actually stopping a cold. And it doesn't even shorten it that much. So to give you guys an example, this is Steve, or this is Bob. He's saying, Steve, can you believe that the idiots leaving here don't even know the first thing about self-defense? He's speaking about his users, the people he's guarding in that house. I know, right? They answered, asked me to quit bothering them about teaching them about knife awareness drills. Don't they know they could just be mugged at any time walking down the street? That's Steve. These two individuals are being paid to keep security of the people in the house, their users. I threw this one in just, just for fun. You guys noticed the difference in between the bubbles? He's actually saying something. He just thinks it because he can't speak. <laughs> Starting to feel this, right? Doesn't feel great. It's uncomfortable. At what point do we realize that at no point during non-security people's day do they think about that tank rolling in? Nor should they. 
if you have a tank rolling into a, a house and you have security people, do you, do, you, do you leave the people in the house and say, good luck? Yes. <laughs> but like, you either take them with you or you barricade or do something. It is their job, the security person's, it's Steve and Bob's job to make sure that those people are safe from that tank, right? It is not the people in the house's job to go out front and go, So why are we making it their job? The hard truth is it's not. We need to stop blaming them for not doing our job. Does that make sense? It sucks, but it makes sense. Passwords will never get better. Don't write them down. Use MFA, password managers. Has anyone ever taught a non-security person how to use a password manager? Tried to. Tried to. Nice. How hard is it? Because those password managers suck. They are user unfriendly. They're user friendly to us. That's what we have to get past. They're user friendly to us because we know how they work. Anyone teach a CEO how to use a password manager? <laughs> it's not fun. Most people pick bad passwords for things. You do too. I guarantee that at least five laptops in this room right now have the word password in the password. And we're security people, just because we're lazy. I got nods over here, so we're good. I got at least two. Password managers aren't supported in many places. It's weird. Anyone ever use a, a website that you can't copy and paste into because of security? It's horrible. Banks. It's always banks. It's horrible. We keep feeding the media stories about 2FA um, and how bad SMS is. Anyone, everyone thinks SMS-based 2FA is bad, right? Everyone's thinking better, like they're like, not, re maybe? Is this trick? But, but users, general non-tech people, don't understand the difference between SMS 2FA and app-based 2FA. It's not their job to know the difference, right? But when you say two-factor authentication SMS is bad, all they hear is two-factor authentication is bad. So why do we keep doing it? Why do, SMS is actually pretty good. Unless you're dealing with someone who can actually spoof a base station, which is kind of easy, but kind of hard. Like, it's not, it's not something I can just go do in a few seconds. I have to actually learn something to do it, right? And I have to be very targeted about who I go after. And I have to know that they're doing 2FA at the time or cause it to happen. Like, there's a lot of steps involved. But we're saying 2FA SMS is bad, and then that's it. We're not giving them any solutions. Simple truth, password managers are hard to use. 2FA, MFA is difficult to use. Anyone in here? And you know what? This is a prize worthy one. So lie. Um, anyone in here successfully migrate all of their 2FA tokens from one phone to another without problems? Yeah. Bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that hand. Oh, sorry. I'm going to hit someone. <laughs> I don't believe you, but I'm going to give you a prize anyways. So we tell people not to write them down. Let's stop making fun of this. I see at least 
once a month, someone has a picture of this exact book and is laughing about it. Why? I taught my mom how to use this in two seconds. She has a different password for everything now on different websites because she uses this book. What threat actor is she going to deal with at home? Her husband? Great. Like, how many APT actors can change the direction of a mic that's built into a laptop? None, right? When are they going to see it out? When she's typing her password in, when they already can access it via the keylogger. Why is this a bad thing? Why do we keep on saying that this is a bad thing? It's not. It actually works in corporate environments too. If they put it in their drawer, big deal. The only threat actors that we're dealing with when they use this is an, a malicious insider who already has access who doesn't need this book. Great, you can do a physical assessment against them and get the book. What does that prove? I can just sit down at the machine and get passwords another way. We need to stop making fun of this because we, we're getting looked at as an industry for guidance on how to do this stuff. And we're not giving them solutions. So, no one ever listens to us, right? That's what we think in our heads. That's what I see on Twitter. But the world is looking at security now. You understand that pressure? We gotta get this right. The world is looking at information security. Management buy-in on security projects is hard. Not anymore, they're throwing money at us. Security programs are sometimes undervalued, absolutely, because we lie about them. We regularly deliver advice in condescending, expensive, and full of friction and hard to follow ways, absolutely. I'm sure none of you in here have ever, has ever been condescending to a manager who just doesn't get it. Not once. I'm sure none of you have ever said, this is going to cost a million dollars or a hundred thousand dollars because we're going to buy the blinky box or build it ourselves or whatever. I'm sure none of you have ever had full of friction conversations with managers who, or, or uh, executives who just didn't get it, right? We need to stop. Companies survive and pay salaries based on revenue. We need to realize that. Like we know it in the back of our head and right now you guys are thinking, I know, I already knew that. But we need to realize it out here instead of in here. Just because you think that building out this SOC, the Security Operations Center, should happen right now because we're dealing with all these threats, doesn't mean the company can afford it. Would you rather them fire you and build the SOC so that they can take your salary and build the SOC? Or would you rather keep your job and build it out slowly? And security keeps on make, getting more expensive. Now, do you know the average cost of an appliance, yes, blinky box, from RSA? What's the average cost? They, did, they actually made an a article about this on RSA's blog. What do you think the average cost is? You know what, this is another prize. See if we can get some interaction going here. 5,000, no. I'm sorry? $10,000, US dollars. 550K, getting closer. Nope, 150K is not even close. 200,000, nope. I'm sorry? 700K, 
Very, very close. I'm sorry? 790? It was 750, so I'm going to give it to this guy over here. Where? Who said 750? All right, here you go. $750,000 was the average cost of a blinky box at RSA this year. Average. How many people in here thinks that that's way too expensive for a blinky box? Everyone. Who thinks they can build a better one? <laughs> Big difference. Our truth, we complain constantly when we don't get our way. We extort companies who, who um, don't do things we want them to do. Everyone ever heard of full disclosure? This is, this is good for the industry, or at least was. Because extortion of this, like saying that this is, like they need to fix things and get them to move, was actually a good thing for a long time. It's not being, it's not that very much anymore. Like it's a rarity where, where you have to push that hard. But we still do it internally. I have seen bug bounty programs go from they're not going to pay me a dollar or they're, they're only going to pay me points or whatever. Um, they marked it as non, non, not going to fix and then they publish it to the internet to get it to get fixed. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Yes. <laughs> we lord our power over and flaunt it regularly at conferences. This might not be BrewCon. This is, I have never been. But I have gone to too many talks where the speaker is up here just like I am right now saying, I own the world. I'm better than everyone. I did all these things. And it's hard. It sucks. Because as, as someone who's listening to that, I can see that the reason why non-tech people don't want to go to security conferences. And we've been forced to talk in business terms instead of hacker terms. Forced. The, uh, this is actually a comment that I heard here at BrewCon during the training. Someone actually said to me that they are being forced to talk into in business terms instead of hacker terms. What does that mean? That means that they feel like they have to do what the business is asking them to do. That's a really bad attitude, right? Just because you're a hacker, just because you're into InfoSec, just because you know amazing things, and I guarantee everyone in here knows amazing things and can hack the world in 500 different ways, doesn't mean that we are better than the business that we are working for. Doesn't mean that we get to tell them what to do because they're paying our salary to do it. We are kind of a bunch of jerks. I told you we'd get uncomfortable. You, me, everyone in here might individually not be jerks, but when we get together, when we get in a pack, that's when it can get bad. Open Wi-Fi is bad, right? Open Wi-Fi is bad? Yeah, I'm not going to answer anymore because it's a trick question. <laughs> so, Evil Twin, Man in the Middle, all of that stuff was super easy, right? So let's play a game. I want you to raise your hands and keep them raised if you have ever done the Evil Twin attack on wireless or um, spun up a, 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 another access point to, to hack into another, or to pretend to be another access point to attack a client, ever, if you've ever done it. 
Keep your hands raised. All right, if, you've, if you have successfully gotten code execution on that client, keep your hands raised. If you have successfully gotten code execution on a client via the evil twin attack within the last year, keep your hands raised. And that's my point. Simple truth is most websites use TLS, SSL, thanks to encrypt. Chrome changes constantly, so it's super hard to attack the browser. Host-based firewalls being on by default is actually a really cool thing. Solutions where you find the crux of the problem is where we need to focus our time. Saying open Wi-Fi is bad is just the symptom of systems that don't do transport and egress and ingress filtering correctly. Not a single hand raised that I could see had actually done an evil twin attack in the last year, year and a half. And I guarantee even at DEF CON, the only people raising their hands are liars or nation states. And I, and I guarantee the nation states won't raise their hand. So why are we saying that open Wi-Fi is bad? Because we've always said it, right? We've always said it. So if I could get, if there's one thing out of this whole talk that I can get you guys to stop saying is that open Wi-Fi is bad. We need to start fixing our mantras that we tell the college students and the high school students and, and the next generations of hackers that are coming up that all of these things that were bad when we were getting into InfoSec are still bad. Antivirus is useless, right? Not a single hand <laughs> raised anymore. It's always a trick. Signature-based detection sucks, right? Signatures are super easy to bypass. If, you, if we were in Didier's class, um, he showed you exactly how to get past all of the macro-enabled uh, AV detections. Very few companies ever look at AV logs. I'll give you a little story. So I was, I was in the Marine Corps. And while I was in the Marine Corps, there was a um, wonderful uh, setup. As, as someone new to InfoSec, I was, I was the go-to for all of the, the horrible jobs, like looking through logs or looking through paper logs or all the, all the all the uh, not-so-fun work. And during this time, there were some AV logs on paper, printed out, of all of the detections that had happened and the solutions. So it said, weather.com plugin detected, removed. Weather.com plugin detected, removed. Spyware detected, removed. Quarantine, quarantine, removed, 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 removed. Now, if it's removed and quarantined, there's no problem, right? What if I told you that one of those on that sheet of paper was pwdump.exe? Anyone, who knows what pwdump.exe is? Who's old enough to have used it? <laughs> All right. What is it? Can you guess? Anybody? Password dumper. But it was removed and quarantined, so it's fine, right? What if I told you that it was on a web server? It was quarantined or removed. So what's the problem? Anybody? What's the problem? How did it get there? Who said that? Nice. Is it, I didn't, didn't I just tell you that story last night? Jeez. Cheater. So how did it get there? It got there somehow, right? It got removed and it has gone somehow, right? 
How many organizations in this room, you don't raise your hands because you're lying, look at AV logs, right? Not very many, especially the ones that say it's been removed, quarantined. Why would I look at those logs at all? Those are some of the best indicators of compromise that you can come across. Oh, it was on a domain controller, sorry. Um, so low hanging fruit is the bread and butter of AV. It doesn't matter if you can bypass it super simple. It's not there to get all of the advanced stuff, the stuff that is crazy and already knows about the AV and knows the bypass. It's there to catch all of the easy stuff, the stuff that you don't want to spend your time on. So we need to stop saying that it's useless. We need to stop saying that it doesn't do anything, that it's easy to bypass. These statements are hurting our industry because the CEOs, the CSOs, the, the executives, the managers that we want, us to, want to listen to us hear us ranting about this. And then they're like, well, why would we renew our license for whatever, semantics, Sophos, whatever? Why would we renew our license if it sucks? Why would we spend more money on it? Why are you telling me to spend more money on it when you online just said, or, or just in this last meeting said, it's horrible, it's easy to bypass. Why would I spend more money on it? So stop bagging on AV. It actually does a lot more than, you, more than we say it does. And if it does happen to be junk, there are some AVs that don't even catch the low hanging fruit. So if it is, remove it, get a new one. Make the change, do something, instead of just yelling and screaming and saying AV sucks. But our statements matter and we need to start realizing that. Roll your own crypto software or software is stupid. Blinky boxes don't fix anything. Anyone see the problem here? We're telling companies that they shouldn't do it themselves. And then we're telling them, don't buy the things. What's left? What's left? What are they supposed to do? So blinky boxes for vendors actually rarely ever do anything. That's what we say. Building your own software to do what a blinky box does really results in an actual finished product. How many people have worked on a, on a, on a project that was supposed to do the blinky box thing and never actually finished? Thank you for being honest. Building authentication on crypto is hard to do well and usually left to frameworks. So we're telling companies that they can't really do either, buy a solution or build it. It results in miscommunication and capabilities and project timelines. So what are we supposed to do? What's the solution here? If I can't tell a company to build it themselves and I can't tell a company to buy the thing, what are they supposed to do? Anybody? Buy the, buy the best available. Buy the best blinky box. How do I know what the best blinky box is? I have to spend $750,000 on a blinky box. It's gonna cost me a lot, so I better be the best. Blinky boxes actually have solid results. If, if, InfoSec people actually invest the time in configuring them. I know way too many companies that have bought the Blinky boxes and never configured it or never spent the time or looked at the vendor and said, you guys suck, I'm not gonna look at your stuff or I don't wanna look at that extra pane of glass. I don't wanna look at another portal that I have to look into just to do my job. If I have to look in seven different logins just to do my job, I don't wanna. I don't wanna. Anyone have kids? That's exactly what we sound like. We 
We're getting paid to do this. It's legacy. Ugh. That's what that sound is. Ugh. Everyone on the planet that works in InfoSec makes that exact sound whenever we hear the word legacy. Ugh. Because we don't get anywhere with it, right? The companies are like, it's legacy, you can't touch it. It's legacy, we can't change it. It's legacy, it's legacy. I'll tell you a story about legacy. At General Electric, we had the D20. The D20 had a vulnerability that came out really rapidly. D20s are things that are ICS systems that go into power stations. General Electric <coughs> has to sell these things to customers, to power stations, to most municipalities, to small little towns that run these D20s. Now, a D20 is a legacy device, or it used to be. It's something that has been around since 1970. It had Telnet open on port 23, unauthenticated. Who thinks that's a critical vulnerability? Why? It's from the 70s. Who thinks it's going to change very fast? Not very many people, right? So, yes, it's a vulnerability. Yes, it's bad. But this came at a time when port 23, open with unauthentication, didn't matter. It wasn't a big deal, because no one had machines connected to the internet back then. You had just this box that did its job, that does its job very well. So how much do you think it would cost General Electric to replace every D20 across the United States just to block the port 23? And how long do you think it would take? We did estimates, so I know. What do you think? Estimates. 10 billion? Close. Two billion dollars. Do you know how long it would take to change every single one across the US? Five to seven years. Do you know how long the researcher gave us to fix it? 90 days. We were expected to spend $2, million, two billion dollars within 90 days and get them changed out. But that's the mindset we have. That's the vulnerability disclosure programs we have. 90 days, which is okay in some cases, which I completely agree with in some cases. So what did we do? Anyone know the story? Like it was in the news quite a bit. We sued him? No. That would be the bad idea. So who said firewall? That's exactly what we did. When we came together as a security uh, group inside of GE, we say, we're like, okay, what are we going to do? The CEO of the company is saying, fix it. And, we're like, and they're listening to us. So someone had the idea to get a Raspberry Pi, put another interface on it, and send them to all of our customers to put in front of the D20s. Well, being GE, we couldn't just go halfway on it and put Raspberry Pis. So they made a piece of hardware that was essentially just IP tables with port 23 blocked. And we sent it out to all of our customers. Do you know how, how much that cost? Each unit was 15 cents. Our solution to the, the president of the company cost just over $100,000 for everything, from the hardware to the installation to get enough employees out to go fix it. $2 billion down to $100,000. These are the types of solutions we need to work on, things that work. And stop saying that legacy is not fixable. We need to look at solutions that actually fix the problem, not the symptom. And we need to stop being scared of it. 
So, legacy systems should not be given exceptions. We need to find solutions. We need to do the work that needs to be done on these things. If it's legacy, we need to do the work. Spend the time, figure out the fix, stop giving it an exception. We need to stop screaming and whining that it's not a 100% solution. All right. So just, I really hate this word. Just sanitize input. How many of you are in here are developers or have been developers in the past? How many have heard the word just sanitize input and got pissed? Yeah. I'm sorry? Just disable NTLM off, just disable WPAD, just disable macros. How many, of, how many of you have tried to get a company to just disable macros? How many of you worked? I don't believe you. <laughs> so um, this is not easy. We, we, we do the, like pen testers, we put these in reports and stuff, right? And, and we rarely do the thing we're telling the company to do or we do it on our own systems. We make solutions on our own little labs that totally work. But they don't work, they don't scale. Did you know that WPAD, NetBIOS, WPAD, LLMR, these Attacks that people use for internal attacks for responder and NTLM Relay X and SMB Relay X and all of these other tools. Do you know that the fix to this is a per user per device problem? Windows has network settings per user per device. Yet we give out these recommendations to just fix it. It's hard. It's actually really hard. You have to set group policy settings in a bunch of different ways, including some registry key changes, just to get this fixed. <coughs> Sorry, one sec. And macros are enabled for our sanitizing input isn't always easy to do. It's rarely easy to do. Some of the frameworks make it easier, and that's where the fix has to happen, in the frameworks. Developers use a lot of frameworks, the Django, .NET, all of these different frameworks <coughs> make it a lot easier to fix these things, but they have to do it in the framework. They have to have fixes available in the framework, because doing this on a custom code base is not easy. And office macros are, are widely used in, for legitimate purposes. So I was doing this test one time, this pen test one time, and we had broken in and we looked around and couldn't find anything. We were coming up short on every assessment uh, of, uh, of services that we were looking at. We're trying to get in to this box and that box and this box, and it was just hitting brick wall after brick wall, which is awesome. But we looked around the system that we had access to, and there was all these doc M and XLSM box, uh, uh, I, files all over the system. We had just so happened to, the, the box that we had fished was a finance officer who sends out this doc M to all of her finance uh, engineers, <coughs> sorry, every day. So we added some macros to her macros and it was great. But 
um, the point is office macros are widely used for legitimate purposes and it's really hard to turn it off. So what we have to do is segment those users in group policy and figure out how to fix it that way and turn it off for the rest of the world inside your organization um, and find those actual solutions versus stuff that is like in a pen test report, just disable macros. And swallowing our own medicine is really hard because implementing the fixes in your test lab or your last job, <coughs> sorry, doesn't mean it scales well. I have read too many pen test reports, I have written too many pen test reports that had simple solutions that when tried to implement in a big organization just don't work. They don't scale. Or they're given to people who don't understand the fix. Because I didn't just put enough information in there. Anyone try and measure cybersecurity stuff? Anyone in metrics? Not us. One, two, cool. Can't measure security. Security is a feeling. Chris Nickerson actually said this best. Security is literally a feeling. People feel secure. That those those security guards in the in the meme earlier, they're not there to secure the place. They're there to make the people inside feel secure. You can't secure something. You can get it to the point where you feel like it is, but that's it. And it's really hard to measure feelings because they are arbitrary and they change all the time. Anyone have a CEO come back from vacation, just have read the newest article in the New York Times about XYZ security and say, we need to fix this now, right? That's a feeling. They feel insecure because they read it in the news. We feel insecure all the time because it's open Wi-Fi. Right? So how do we fix this? How do we, how do we say or measure this feeling that we have? We need to measure it based on performed actions. So here are some ideas. How about how many new rules were created? Me as a pen tester, if I cause six rules to be created that actually find bad actors, I have done my job. This is actually pretty amazing. I love it when new rules are created for the stuff that I run. Like there was an organization who put in a new rule to find whenever cmd.exe was run from word.exe or in word.exe. This is awesome. Or a new process outside of uh, Word was created. This is awesome. I love it. And this is a metric that I can't see, though, as a pen tester. This is hard for me. Metrics should be done for pen testing by the organization, not the pen test company. Asset coverage. We're going to be talking about asset management in a second. But numbers, how many, how many people in here think that they have every single asset in their organization forwarding logs correctly? <laughs> yeah, no one, no one went for that one. <clears throat> what coverage of the attack framework do you have? This is all post-exploitation stuff. Time to detection, time to eradication is actually a pretty common one. Phishing domain that was found before the attack. How would you detect a phishing domain before an actual fish comes in? I'm sorry? Yeah, transparency logs. Now, one of the things that is interesting um, that you have to kind of have had experience with as a defender is that many times attackers will test their domains before they actually send the fish to verify that it'll work. So they'll send in a tracking link or whatever 
to see if it'll work, if they'll get a ping on it through a, a user that has no, no other detail in the attack. So they'll send it to Bob, and I use Bob a lot, so sorry, Bobs. They'll send it to Bob, he'll go to the domain with the word thing, it won't do anything, it won't execute anything, it won't have a macro, it'll just have a link and see if that it can go through. They'll see that it works in the organization, it gets through the proxy or whatever other protections they have, and then they send the fish later. We've actually caught a fish cam phishing campaign because of that tracking link. Weird behavior on a, a workstation before the attacker made it to prod. Anyone ever catch or get got caught by a, um, a defender who was who alerted because of some weird traffic or weird things going on in the system, right? I was caught one time after I'd gotten into an organization because the Oracle admin, that's all he did was watch this Oracle database. And he saw the, that the Oracle database spiked for 100% for all of 30 seconds because I was trying to run code. He ran down the hall, and I heard this story uh, secondhand, but he ran down the hall to the CSO and saying, hey, we got something weird. I have no idea how this worked, but we got something weird on the box. And that triggered an investigation that got me caught within maybe 30 minutes. Malicious insiders detected before they stole something. I can't tell you a story about this, but it has happened. <laughs> We need to start measuring failures as well. How many of you in this room are pen testers, red teamers, attack, offense? Raise your hand. How many of you, keep your hands raised. Keep your hands raised if you, on your report, tell the customer how many times you were detected or found or things that you tried didn't work. Really? That's actually awesome. It's really actually encouraging that that is more of a thing. We need to start doing that more. If you tried to get into a Windows box or a web server and it didn't work, that should be on your report, that they are doing something positive. How many of you uh, have seen a talk where a red teamer came up on stage, pen tester came up on stage and says, this is how I was caught? I've done one of those a while ago, and that's it. It doesn't happen very often, and we need to do more of it. So if you are in this room, BrewCon next year, that's your talk. How did you get caught? IT sucks at asset management. Asset management has been IT's domain forever. Usually it's focused on around the procurement and decommissioning of processes. So usually asset management is when they put the sticker on, right? We as security people think asset management is all digital. It's usually not. It's usually just a spreadsheet somewhere. Cloud-based assets can appear and disappear within minutes. How do you think IT is supposed to track that when DevOps is the new thing and they're spinning up new instances and taking them down and they get the same IPs all the time? Anyone ever try asset management on wireless devices? It's not easy. So why are we making it IT's job? The security teams usually have all those logs. Nine times out of 10, when I go to a security organization and they're tracking down an IP, they can do it within minutes to hours. They can find out what that host is. Yet, we're putting it on IT to do asset management. Does that make any sense? When we have all the logs, why are we making it IT's job? That's the product I want to see at RSA next year. Something that takes all the logs from security stuff, from Splunk, from uh, Kafka, from all of the other log management stuff, and then makes it into an a asset management tool. 
I run something like that at home, I want to see it as a product, I don't have the time to make it. Why do we keep on passing the blame to those whose priorities aren't shared with us? We do it a lot with, like all of these things I've talked about, is all us passing the buck, passing the blame to someone else. So here's all the other things that um, I got listed from people I asked for online. Um, there, weren't, there aren't enough InfoSec people. You should stay and watch uh, MZ Bat's talk on how this can be fixed. Her keynote is going to be exactly on this topic. We don't have enough time. It's because we can't hire or afford people. No one else cares about security. That's stupid. Everyone cares about security right now. They just don't care about it in the same way you do. InfoSec salespeople are charlatans. Nope. They're just salespeople. They're doing their job. If they're lying about their product, they're actually doing their job. They are salesmen. They're trying to get you to buy things. We need to realize that that is their job and how they do it. InfoSec has so much drama. Anyone think that InfoSec has drama? Yeah, a lot of it. The best thing you can do is not be an audience because that's the only way drama exists. Laser, laser focus on edge cases where the basics is what we suck at. The basics are actually pretty hard. So um, we need to just uh, do our damn jobs. AI and ML is the end of the world. Yep, I'm with you. I think that I don't want to ever fight a Terminator. General apathy. Again, we need to do our jobs. We need to stop complaining. Step up and do it. Perfection required versus good enough. Um, a lot of us in this room are probably perfectionists. We, d we get to do security because we try way too hard to fi figure out a problem that everyone else just walks away from. We need to st stop making that how we do work or business as well. When, we, when it's good enough, it can be good enough. And that's me. And that's it. And thank you so much for BrewCon. I really appreciate your time. Anyone know what that picture is? That's Disney World, and the person who operates the 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 ride step away step uh, stepped away for a second, and uh, I took a picture of the ICS system that controlled the the ride I was about to get on. I still got on it. All right. Thank you very much for your time.